Good morning. How's the family this morning? If you don't know me, or you're new to the church, don't shoot me. This is just props. I don't want to be shot at thinking I'm fixing to raid this building, okay? It could happen. You know, a threat in the church nowadays will get you shot pretty quick, especially in a cowboy church, amen? Call security, you bet. I know what some people are saying. Oh, no. Brother Reggie brought guns in the church. He's going to hell and he's trying to take us all with him. What's the deal? <laughs> no. You know, I, I like props. I like things that, that uh, get your attention. And uh, you walk in with a gun nowadays, it'll get people's attention, I assure you. <laughs> so, you know, we're getting close to uh, just a bunch of things going on. Uh, uh, seasons are changing. And... Uh, We've had a pretty good week. We uh, we got some rain. Any of you notice a little cool front come through with that rain? You know, the first cool front of the year and stuff like that. So it's been an amazing week here in Texas, especially to get an early cold front in August. We don't normally get that here in Texas. And a couple of days there, I think many of you agree, it kind of felt like fall was already starting to slide in a little early this year. You know, and fall is a great time for fishing and hunting. But this is the time of year that most of the people that like to hunt are getting ready for the season. Isn't that right, Joey? Yeah, we got a bunch of people that like to hunt, and they're, that's what they're doing. They're preparing. On September the 1st, dove season opens. And then just a short time later in October 2nd, archery season opens for uh, white-tailed deer here in Texas. So everybody's getting ready. And then... The general season starts right after that. It starts October 6th. So all this preparation is going on right now by these hunters getting out there, getting everything ready and making sure they're ready for the, the season, that everything's in place. And if you know a deer hunter, you know they have, they've been preparing for deer season ever since the season ended last year. You know, even though that, they, they, it's over, they're, they're continually trying to get things done. They spend time planting food plots for the deer to eat, doing repairs on their feeders and their stands, and making sure their archery equipment or guns are in good working order. They even head out to the gun range to either practice up or their shooting skills or just adjust the sights on their uh, guns and stuff to make sure they're accurate. And deer hunters, are they're a, they're a different cut, just like a fisherman. I think they got their own thing going on. They're dedicated to their sport. They're dedicated to all the hard work that goes into it. And I read this story. This is pretty cool. It talks about the deer hunter's dedication and where their priorities are. It says a group of friends went deer hunting and paired off in twos for the day. That night, one of the hunters returned alone, staggering under a 10-point buck. Where's Harry? Harry had a stroke of some kind, the guy said. He's a couple of miles back up the trail. The other guy said, you left Harry laying up there and carried the deer back? That was a tough, tough call, the hunter said. But I figured nobody's going to steal Harry. <laughs> They're pretty dedicated to their sport, when you say. You know, all these uh, hunters, they get out and they prepare everything. And like I say, they want to get their sights in. They want to make sure that everything's working properly and that, everything, that their sights are accurate. That what they shoot at, they're going to hit. And they do this to be sure that they can hit that target when the opportunity arises. Because... Sometimes you don't get very many opportunities to take that right buck or hit those uh, dove that come flying in, stuff like that. So you do need to practice a little bit. And some of them hunt dove, turkey, hogs, or deer. It doesn't matter if you're not accurate at what you do. You're kind of out there just wasting bullets. They just want to make sure their aim is right on target. That's why they get out and do all this, absolutely. And back in the early years, being a sharpshooter was important because it could be the difference between life and death, the difference between eating and not eating. And back then, people actually ate almost everything they killed just to survive. You know, they didn't care what it was. If uh, they shot it, they're going to clean it and they're going to eat it. And if you've ever watched Mel Gibson's movie, The Patriot, there's a scene where the Redcoats have forced him into the war by killing his son. 
And he burned, they burned his home and arrested his oldest son, if you've ever watched that movie. And as the British army rides off with his oldest son, Mel Gibson quickly gathers his two remaining younger sons and a handful of muskets, and he sets out to run ahead of them and set up an ambush to rescue his son. As they hurried setting up, he reminds his boys of what he has taught them about shooting. Remember, aim big, miss big. Aim small, miss small. The point in this is if you aim at the whole target, you will likely miss. If you aim at a small point on your target, even if you miss the spot, you'll hit the target. Good, good thinking. And life can be the same way. There are many times life can be so big and so overwhelming that we become wide-eyed and and everything that we're facing at the time. You know, it can be overwhelming to us. And we can begin just to fire away wildly at life as it just passes us by. We really don't give it a lot of thought. We just get a little crazy out there. And here's where we also must learn to be focused so that our lives are on target. And sometimes we're not focused good. We're just shooting wildly or running through life that way. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. We're going to pick up there this morning if you join me. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom. Instruction. Go, what's that got to do with it all? This scripture tells us that when we allow the Lord through the reading of his word and prayer to reveal our directions, he keeps us focused. But when we go at life on our own, we soon find ourselves casting off wise restraints and allowing our lives just to run amok. Any of you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like your life was running amok with no sense of direction at all? It, many of us have gotten to that point at times in our lives where it's like our life is totally out of control. That we really don't have any direction. We don't even have any sense about us, about what to do or where to go or how to handle anything in our lives. We can get to that point. Especially if we don't stay in God's word. And this is why people should store in their minds and hearts the words offered in Proverbs 3. Let's go there. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Lean on him. Trust not in your own understanding. That's what he's trying to tell us. We've got to get in his word. We've got to understand his direction for our lives. You know, like it says, we get out there. We, we're, just, we're just out of control. We do things that we really don't know why we're doing them because actually we don't, maybe we're not prepared. We're not ready. We don't understand how to take care of a situation. Many years ago, me and my brother and a bunch of friends, I think there were about 10 of us, went on a hunting trip. Uh, we didn't care what we were going to shoot. We had shotguns, and we were going to shoot whatever came up, right? We were just kids. We were young. We were just out there doing our thing. And we figured out that there was this one big stock tank, which is a pond to many of you. And, you know, in the day, they built them, and they were, had dams all the way around them. You know, and just had a pipe that let the water run out and stuff. So we knew that this pond was there, and we also knew there were going to be ducks on that pond. Now, was it duck season? I can't tell you that. Did it matter at that time, at that age? No, it was just ducks. So we come up with this bright idea that to make sure no ducks got away, we're going to surround the pond. Somebody all the way around it. They're not going to get out of that pond. So we all crawled up in our positions, and then some fool... Stuck his head up a little too high, and there went the ducks. Well, the guys didn't even care who was on the other side of the pond. They just started shooting. Was that wise? No, that wasn't wise. Nobody got hit, but it was, it was close. Because we didn't have any direction. We didn't have any sense about what we were doing. We were just going to do it. 
Don't we go through life that way sometimes? Where we're just going to do it. We don't, we, you know, we, we don't really have a direction where it's taking us. And there are many Christians today that are living their lives if they were running aimlessly all over the place with no set goals. No set goals of any kind or deliberate strategy for spiritual growth in their life. And the spiritual growth is very important. If you're going to stay on target, you need your spiritual life in the right direction. Many times we find ourselves taking aim at, at the right spiritual targets, though. If we just look for the right spiritual targets. All too often for some Christians, though, saying ready, aim, fire is ignored. In favor of a hasty, unfocused saying, which is ready, fire, aim. Because sometimes that's the way we do it. Amen. And it just makes our life a bigger mess. Because we're not prepared. And a wise Christian should be a spiritual sharpshooter for God. One who looks to the Lord and to his word to select his or her targets and goals. And then takes aim in life by pursuing them diligently. Rather than just expending lots of random energy that's not focused on the targets and the goals learned from scripture. And not seeking the Lord's lead. Number one problem in our lives, not seeking the Lord's lead. We don't want to be behind, the God, behind God. We want to be out in front. That never works. I've tried that. You're just waiting for a failure there. God's lead is perfect. Ours isn't. And his lead will always be perfect. And his word is perfect. But if we don't stay in his word and we don't practice in his word, then how can we really be steady and take aim and hit the targets that he'd want us to hit in our lives, right? These guys that go out and hunt and shoot, they practice. They practice. It doesn't do them any good to go out there if they can't hit anything, right? Cows and horses, everything else out in that field might be in danger, right? You got to practice. In the same way that we should practice our walk with the Lord daily. That we should be in His Word and look for His direction. Share our goals. Share our goals with God. Say, hey, this is the goal I have for my life. Are you on board with that? His word will back it up or it won't. But you got to get in his word to find out. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 26. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse six. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. And this is defined a little bit better in the CEV, which is the contemporary English version. I don't run without a goal. I don't box by beating my fist in the air. Pretty well makes common sense. Running aimlessly without a goal in mind leads you to nowhere. Everyone should have goals in their lives. Number one goal is seek God. Number two goal, seek God in his direction and then present your goals to him and see if his goals are what lines up with yours. Then you have something steady, a target to work toward because everyone should have goals. I don't care if you're sitting here today and you think, well, I'm too old for goals. That's not true. Everyone should have goals in their lives. And we should have God's blessing on the direction that we go after those goals. In our Christian walk, we should not run aimlessly, but start taking aim at specific and worthwhile targets. Are the targets you're aiming at today, are they worthwhile? Are they just meaningless? Many Christians today, they live reactively. Reactively. They are content to react or to respond to life around them. Content, they respond. Sometimes they respond without any knowledge of what they're talking about. It's just reactive. Many times we say things that we can't even back up with Scripture. We should never do that. We should always make sure we can back up what we're trying to share with someone with Scripture. And never do a knee-jerk reaction on anything. Everything should be thought through. 
something good's not going to come out of your mouth, maybe you shouldn't say it. That, that doesn't happen a whole lot, does it? We understand that the brain is connected to the heart. So what comes out of the heart through the mouth, that's what it's full of. What's coming out of your mouth is negative, and it's not very nice, and your heart's going to be full of that. It's time for a heart replacement, right? We need something new in our heart. We need to fill it with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. That will change everything coming out of our mouths. The wise Christian, they live their life proactively. They take the initiative rather than adopting a passive attitude in their Christian walk. I'm going to tell you right now, there's nothing passive about me. You want to get into some conversation, especially if it has anything to do with Jesus Christ, let's talk about it. I always say, now I can run off a Jehovah Witness. They used to run me off. You want to talk about Jesus, let's talk about it, right? Let's get into it. I'm more confident today because I know God's Word. I read God's Word. I stay in God's Word. I'm more confident that I don't have to run away from that person because I know whether they're using God's Word in the way it's supposed to, and I know whether they're telling me the truth or not. And the truth will set you free, amen? So we need God's Word, especially if you're uncomfortable talking to someone about Jesus Christ. If you're uncomfortable leading someone to know Jesus Christ, once you get into God's Word, that all gets easier because you have the confidence. And then you set these goals, and God backs them up and gives you direction and confidence to achieve those goals in our lives. And there's some people that have these goals in the back of their head, and they're saying, you know, I really want to set this as a goal. I really want to do this, but I don't think I can. Right? Immediately, I don't think I can do that. That's not possible. Anything's possible with God. Amen? So we can't say that. I guess you can if you don't know God's Word. And if we read the Bible and we understand everything that happened in the Bible, and this is way back there, right? Everything that happened in the Bible. If we believe that, why can't it happen today? In today's society, it can't. We've just slid God out of the way a little bit here in our new society. Less people in church, less people believe in God. You know, they think that's just a bunch of stories. It's some great stories. But when we all get to heaven, that's going to look a little bit different, right? The people that do not know Jesus Christ, are they all at once going to go, uh-oh, <laughs> I might have made a mistake on this. Maybe I should have been reading God's Word a little bit more, keeping the devil off of me and staying out of that sinful life. And we don't know. Maybe when we get to heaven, we're not going to care. We're not going to care at all about any of that stuff because it's going to be the greatest place we've ever been in our life. So why would we care? Those little things that have no meaning, why would we carry them to heaven with us? Because... Everything has meaning in heaven. A victorious Christian has a purpose and has objectives. They stay focused on those purposes and those objectives. That's a victorious Christian. Are you a victorious Christian today? Or do you want to be? Focused. Taking aim at the right things. We should take careful aim at some things in our Christian lives by being sure that we target meaningful and important issues in our lives. Things that are unimportant and have no meaning, why do we even worry about them, right? There's people every day that I talk to that are worrying about something that's never going to happen. You say, how do you know that? It's never going to happen. It's just made up in their minds, right? People do that every day. And the Bible tells us, why do we worry about tomorrow? Why? We don't know what tomorrow holds. Why do we worry about it? We may not even be here tomorrow. We may all be in heaven, aren't we? Is everybody going to heaven with me? Huh? <laughs> I hope you are. So don't worry about tomorrow. And don't worry about yesterday. It's gone, right? I guess if we're going to worry at all, it'd be about today. But the Bible tells us, do not worry at all. Lay it all on, at God's feet.
We will continue to have stress in our lives and disruptions. And if we're focusing on the things in life that have no meaning or importance, those things are just going to blow up. The stress, everything else is just going to get worse. Disruptions in our lives, it's just going to get worse. Because we have enough going on in our lives that have meaning and are important than to worry about all those other things that we just keep throwing in there with it. So all at once you go from simple things to a massive problem that we add on. We add on ourselves. I'm bad about that. We can add on. Even when a problem's small, we can make it big, right? Don't make a mountain out of molehill. Haven't you heard that? So we do that. Pretty bad about that sometimes even. Do you have a goal in your life that has meaning and importance this morning? Goals serve as a stimulus for life. If you have a goal, it'll stimulate your life. They tend to tap the deeper resources and draw out life's best from us. Where there are no goals, neither will there be any significant accomplishments in our lives. Isn't it great when you set a goal and you reach it? I mean, that is the greatest feeling to set a goal and reach that goal and knowing that you did it with God's help, right? That's a great feeling. If you set a goal to go lead someone to Christ that you know needs to know and needs to come to Jesus Christ, and you set that as a goal and you accomplish like that, that is the greatest feeling, the greatest feeling ever. And then we set unrealistic goals sometimes. I'm going to win the lottery. I hear that all the time. I'm going to win the lottery. And when I do, I'm going to give to the church. <laughs> you can give to the church right now and you might win the lottery. Right? Amen? Isn't that the way that works? Set realistic goals. We should be doing that. And it'll give us some stimulation in our lives, especially when we, we uh, achieve those goals. And we should all be setting desirable and biblical goals. And then deliberately... Structure our lives to press forward to reach each one of those goals. Deliberate spiritual goals. How many of you can say today that you have spiritual goals set in your life? When I say spiritual goals, I want to get to know Jesus Christ better. I want to get to know God's word better. Those are goals. I want to be a better church member. I want to be a bigger part of this church family. I want to be a benefit to God. Those are goals, spiritual goals. I'd like to read the whole Bible. That's a goal. But if you look at it as a whole, any goal can be overwhelming. You have to break it down. You have to break it down into small pieces so you enjoy what you're doing. How do you eat an elephant? One piece at a time. Same thing. You have to break it down where you're excited about it each time. It's not a burden on your life to do these things, to set these goals and move forward. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate, narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. This is where the saying, stay on the straight and narrow originated right here. Stay on the straight and narrow. Defined, it says, the broad way... Appeals to many. And it does. The broad way appeals to many. And it ends in destruction. Every time. The narrow way. It doesn't appeal to the flesh as much. But it's God's way. It's God's way. Absolutely. And it leads to eternal life. So many people want to take that. Broad way. They want the easy way. It is easy to get into heaven. Accept, believe, and commit. 
live your life in the right way. It's easy to get into heaven. You don't have to go out and work at it. You're not going to earn your way in heaven. Accept, believe, and commit. Live your life with some clean living. Try to keep sin out of there. Is it going to get in there? Yeah. Every one of us is going to have sin in our lives. You know, we're going to fall down from time to time. Just drive through Dallas one day. You'll you'll see yourself falling down time to time. <laughs> Slip up a little bit and go. Forgive me, Lord. That person just no, never mind. We won't go there. We all should be aiming for the small gate and the narrow roads in our lives. Straight to Jesus Christ. Not just running amok all over the place with our life just aimlessly out of control. Being a spiritual sharpshooter means taking aim to please God. Taking aim to please God. How many of you are spiritual sharpshooters this morning? Taking aim to please God. John chapter 8 verse 29. And Jesus was speaking there. Right here he says, the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone for I always do what pleases him. Always do what pleases him. Don't we wish we could do that? Wouldn't it be great if we could always do what pleases God? You know, they got the little bands that says, what, what would Jesus do as a reminder? Do we need a reminder? If Jesus is in your heart, you shouldn't. Always do what pleases him. Pleasing God should be a standard in our lives for all Christians to use in making decisions in their lives through their conduct and through their thoughts, by asking ourselves every time, and my wife uses this on me a whole lot, will this please the Lord? I hate it when she does that. Truly do. But if we were asking ourselves that every time before we made those decisions or said those things in our lives, our lives might get a little bit better. Then we're taking aim at the right things. Amen. Today's a good day to start perfecting our aim right here today. Getting prepared just like the hunters are right now. Getting prepared for the season. We should be getting pre prepared and perfecting our aim. We should make sure we're taking aim at the worthy targets that align with God's word. Worthy targets that align with God's word. You have to think about those. What would please God Keep in mind this, though, that many sharpshooters, they practice to become accurate. The way we can practice to become a spiritual sharpshooter is to practice by reading our Bibles, using God's Word to take aim and stay focused on the meaningful and important things in our daily lives. Practice. Practice reading your Bible. You go, wait a minute, that's a stretch. No, it's not. If you want to get good at anything, you have to practice. They say uh, practice makes perfect. That's not true. Perfect practice makes perfect. Amen. But actually, there's nothing perfect but Jesus Christ and his word. So why wouldn't we want to have that on our side and in our lives? And being a spiritual sharpshooter should not be just for a season. You know, the... When we go hunting, all these seasons open up, dove, deer, all that. It opens up as a season, season, so it's just a, a, a temporary time during the year. But being a spiritual sharpshooter for God, we should be that way our entire lives here on earth. Amen? And be prepared. Be prepared. The Bible tells us to be prepared. The best way to lead someone else to Christ or enjoy your life in Christ is to be prepared. Understand his word. Understand the direction. Set goals. Set goals. Don't set ridiculous goals. But today I would challenge you to set a goal in your life that you've been thinking about for a long time. Talk to God about it. Make sure it lines up with his word and his values. And go after it. You'll be amazed how quick you can reach that goal when you've got God pushing you forward. And right there with you. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you today and we lift this day to you, Father. We're just thankful. Father, we're thankful for all the blessings and favor you uh, pour out us on us here in your church house and this church family. Father, we're thankful 
that you love us enough and care about us enough, Father, that you provide us with a purpose in life. You provide us with a direction. And Father, you ask us to set goals and take aim at those goals. And Father, you're the steady hand that holds, holds us so we can take aim and hit those targets. So Father, today, I pray, Father, that, uh, that you just reach down and touch someone that's struggling today, that they're Life is just out there running amok all over the place, and they have no sense of direction in their lives. Father, that you would touch them. Reach down and just touch them on the shoulder, Father, and say, hey, I'm right here waiting on you. All you have to do is seek me. Father, I know right now in our lives, times are tough. Things are different. But, Father, we have the power of prayer and the Holy Spirit with us, and if we hang on to that, we can hit the target you'd want us to hit. Father, we love you. We praise you. Father, I pray today that everything we said, everything we did was glorifying, uplifting, and pleasing to you. And we ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.